Are you a speaker who's still struggling with your topic? Perhaps you want to create some intellectual property that can make you very sellable. If you're looking to get booked as a speaker and paid as soon as possible, then you will need what we're talking about in this episode. We're going to cover one step that once completed means you can start prospecting for speaking opportunity right away. So make sure you stay tuned to the end because I'm going to share with you exactly the process that I have been working on in creating my keynote. Welcome to Present Influence, the show that helps business leaders to develop the skills to influence and inspire. My name is John Ball. I'm a keynote coach, professional speaker, and your guide on the journey to leadership level communication and presentation skills. My mission is to provide rising business leaders like you with everything you need to maximize your impact and present with influence. Follow the show on your favorite podcast app for weekly episodes and interviews with influence experts and amazing guests. Welcome back then to the second part of my keynote creation series, where I'm inviting you to join me in my creation journey of a new professional signature keynote talk. In the previous episode on this, I talked about concept and positioning. And if you haven't listened to that, please do go back and check it out. Now, that episode was a short introduction to these longer episodes where I will share more of my creative journey and process with you. One thing I didn't share in that first episode was that I was feeling a little challenged in narrowing down my topic to speak on. My professional mission is, well, maybe just a little too big to be able to achieve fully with one talk. It's probably too big to achieve full stop, but still, it's my mission. So I wanted to create something actionable and that clearly solves a problem and moves people in the direction of my larger mission. One of the things I try to express to clients I work with who either are or want to be professional speakers is that the problem they solve can either be a nice to have or a need to have. But if you find yourself approaching prospects who have tight budgets, nice to have isn't a need to have and is easier to say no to need to have solutions are the kind that people will find the money for even when budgets are tight. Now that might not be a hundred percent foolproof. After all, they could always go with a cheaper speaker or a bigger name or someone in the same area as you. So need to have is not something that you could necessarily use to hold leverage over prospects with and nor should you. If you're looking to be a professional speaker in corporate or nonprofit or education, it probably is a good idea to aim for the need to have solutions. If you're perhaps in more of a faith-based space, you might have a bit more leeway here. There are areas of speaking where perhaps need to have isn't so essential. If you're in the inspirational or motivational speaking space, people are probably always going to need or want those things. So you may want to instead focus in on how you can differentiate yourself in the marketplace or create your own IP, IP being short for intellectual property, if you're unfamiliar with that term. When you are approaching prospects, you will want to be very clear about what you're offering them and what the transformation will be for the people who you speak to. One of the first tasks that I set myself when I started drafting my talk was to come up with a clear objective. It had to be an objective I knew I could help with. It would be valuable to audiences and to businesses and be a valuable part of my mission. With this in mind, I decided that one of the fastest and most impactful transformations that I could offer would be helping my audience to gain some emotional mastery. The objective of the talk is going to be to educate and empower my audience to be able to proactively decide how they want to show up each day and how they want to respond to people in their professional and in their personal environments. Now, this proverbially kills many birds with one stone. Not that I approve at all of throwing stones at birds. When I'm constructing a talk, I want to get all my possible ideas down and start pulling out the best bits from there. So I don't like to limit myself or edit myself at this point. I want to have unlimited thinking. And make sure I put the objective of the talk front and center and then work backwards from there. I didn't want to worry too much about structure just yet, but I did start to think that this could be a good place to come up with a framework. 
at the moment, I have a nine point framework, which is still in process and clearly far too much framework for one keynote. It's not a bad thing. This is something that could help when it comes time to create courses or books that I may want to go with the content of the keynote. So nothing is ever wasted in this process unless you choose to bin it. I used to be very perfectionistic about my creative process. When I was younger, I used to write a lot of music and I would often throw away music, sheet music and concepts and chord progressions that didn't seem to work only to days or weeks later, try and recall what they were. And in the end, I stopped throwing away my imperfections and realized that the creative process for me, at least, and for many others is one of iteration. So the stuff that doesn't seem good right now might well be useful later or lead to another idea that could be good further on. Nothing is wasted. Now, I don't recommend that you necessarily create a nine-step process for yourself. I may well try to simplify mine a little bit more just for the sake of brevity. I knew I would realistically only have time in a keynote to talk about three elements of the framework. Maybe four if I do have to extend time on stage or I get asked to deliver a longer talk. I wouldn't really go beyond four just due to the reality of how much content people can effectively retain. Even four key points in a talk feels like a bit of a stretch to me. If I were to need to speak longer, this should really speak to the people who do try to pack lots and lots of content into a keynote talk. Less is definitely more. If I was asked to speak for longer than 60 minutes, I would probably look to add more stories, maybe do a little crowd work to keep things energized and keep things moving. Creating a framework for transformation can be a really powerful tool and a great differentiator in the marketplace. It's something that for me also allowed me to start to create clear learning objectives for my abstract. If you haven't come across the term abstract in this regard before now, Effectively, it's a one sheet for a speaker that has their info, their talk or workshop description, and some key points or learning objectives on there. It usually will contain a testimonial and some references too. Now, I'm making a version of my abstract available for you to check out, and you can find the link in the show notes. You'll see some blurred info sections because, well, sadly, there are some crazy people out there who I don't want calling me or the referees I have listed on there. Of course, I don't mean you, lovely listener, but we should all be careful about putting our personal information out into public forums. I've had online stalkers before, and I promise you, it's not fun. Something to note here, having an abstract is enough for you to be able to get booked without needing to have the website, possibly even without a demo video, although those things do help a lot and are good to have as a professional speaker. I will spend some time further down the line with this series on things like my prospecting practices, as well as things like website creation and demo video creation. I have a guest coming up soon who has some really nice, specific, detailed information, exciting stuff as well, on demo video creation. So if you're thinking of getting yourself a demo video, you're wanting to update yours, or you're wanting to maybe start to create one, make sure you subscribe to the show because you won't want to miss that. My next steps in my tool creation process are to create a few more abstracts because I want to have three, maybe four talks listed on my website. So a couple of talks at least, maybe one, maybe two workshops as well. The description and learning objectives will go onto the website when they're finished. And I hope that you'll join me for the episodes on those as well. Now, I didn't mention before about my talk title creation. So let's quickly get to that before we finish up for today. There are two main schools of thought that I've come across when it comes to talk titles. One is the does what it says, matter of fact title, which I call the Ron Seal title after a long running UK ad for Ron Seal Woodstain. The tagline of which I think they still use today is does exactly what it says on the tin. So, you know, if your talk title maybe does exactly what it says on the tin, that would be what I'd call a run seal title. The other is perhaps a little more abstract, maybe even playful. It evokes curiosity and perhaps even a little humor. Might be clever, but it should still give some idea, maybe even a good idea about what the talk is about without needing to give away any surprises. 
we could call this one the teaser title. If you have other suggestions for what you should call that, I would love to hear them. It may or may not come as a surprise to you at this point that my preference leans more towards the teaser, but it's not essential that you only use one and not the other. Now, I tend to use the Ron Seal approach, the does what it says on the tin approach for workshop titles, because there I feel it's more helpful to know what's coming in a more interactive experience. Since my talk is about personal state management, showing up every day as our best selves, I wanted something to express that. And after a little playful brainstorming, I ended up with a song title. And song titles can be great to use as, as talk titles where appropriate. I went with Hook on a Feeling. It's a fun song that I could probably incorporate in some way. And there's a subtitle to give a little more insight, which is how to get one day closer to your best self every day. Now, please understand at this point that I'm sharing my creative process as it's moving, not after completion. So all of this is still subject to change, but I'm liking the feel of it so far. And I'm sharing this hopefully as a teaching tool, not as a means for feedback. My creative process is mostly a solo one rather than a community effort. However, once the creative process is complete, I will very actively welcome any feedback on the talk and the content at that point. I've left my speaker page website address unblurred on my abstract if you do go and look at it, but the page isn't yet live. So I will let you know on this show when the page goes live. But let's leave things here for today. And I want to give you some exciting news about my guest for next week's episode. I was very happily introduced to my guest through the Podmatch service, which I really like. Has met so many amazing guests through that. And Podmatch introduced me to a gentleman called Mitch Carson. Mitch and I have discovered we have many friends or connections in common. He is an expert in selling from the stage. Now, it's a whole new ball game for speakers and communicators where the risk is greater, but so are the rewards. Mitch is going to be sharing his insights into effective selling from the platform, who it's for and who it's not for, and the differences in there to professional keynoting and why this episode may be essential for people who have their own courses, books, product to sell from the platform. Now, I will share with you, I was completely absorbed in everything Mitch was saying, and I don't know if I really want to be a professional platform salesperson. I would like to be able to know that I could do it if it was required of me. One of my criteria when I'm looking for guests is that I want guest episodes to be unmissable. And I would definitely call this episode with Mitch unmissable. So I hope you won't miss it and will follow the show on your favorite podcast player or on YouTube. But for now, wherever you're going, whatever you're doing, have an amazing week and see you next time.